Right, so this morning, the topic of my conversation or this presentation is what I've called AMPs, <coughs> which many of you may know measures current flow. Uh, it's basically alternate mitigation plans. And these are alternate plans to the current formal risk mitigation independent power producers procurement program, uh, where there's currently an RFP in circulation. And uh, this is a series of suggestions as to um, how we can perhaps bring uh, new generation capacity to market faster via what I've called AMPs. This is really going to be the core theme of my presentation today. So I want you to first of all focus on the X axis uh, where I've got increasing integration with the grid and with existing utility assets, uh, namely ESCOM assets primarily. On the Y axis, I've got increasing PPA tariffs and increasing adverse emissions. And the thesis of my presentation today, or the core of my presentation today, is going to show that the current RFP isn't making full and good use of the existing grid or of existing utility assets. And by doing so, it is uh, not taking full advantage of these existing national assets. So if we <coughs> focus on the, uh, the risk mit mitigation RFP, um, one can only meet the fairly onerous requirements of the RFP in terms of the conditions they set by using either diesel or some other fuel or gas, which is, is less, um, has fewer emissions, but also cost will cost less. And then we can do gas and solar. Uh, and that's more or less uh, the limit of what can be done within the RFP. Uh, the gas and solar could also maybe have a bit of storage with it. <coughs> On the other hand, the AMPS, presentation, we're looking at solar wind storage, and we're using um, uh, spare pump capacity that resides within uh, the utility assets. So we're really using all of the uh, utility assets to the full um, in my AMPS presentation or the AMPS proposal. And of course, we could find some middle ground there if we were able to model, modify the uh, RFP or the request for proposals and we were able to do gas, solar, wind and storage and take advantage of the fact that the grid would connect all of these facilities together and they should be able to communicate and talk to each other. So in very simple terms, a, a battery sitting at a wind site um, if it, and if you had a solar site with a battery, when the solar site battery was empty shortly after uh, sunset, uh, spare wind capacity from the wind site, if it had filled up the wind battery, could be wheeled to the solar site and that would then uh, facilitate uh, uh, double usage of the solar battery, so to speak. Okay, this is just a reminder of where we sit at the moment with regard to climate change. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much now or never and I was amused this morning when I saw on the South Africa Renewable Future Energy Group that Mike Levington had, had put the two words TikTok uh, on a post to that group um, in response to the fact that things seem to be moving rather slowly and fortuitously, um, just to highlight the fact that we need to move faster than we're currently moving, I've got TikTok on this particular image as well. So the clock's ticking on climate change. Uh, we're currently sitting in a position where ESCOM, or as I've sometimes called him, ESCOM man, has got a Herculean or Sisyphus task of trying to improve the energy availability factor of the ESCOM fleet. And as he makes some gains in terms of getting this energy availability factor uh, improved, uh, if he stops and slacks off for a second, of course, you can see what happens. So I'm actually advocating that ESCOM man, or it's time to break free uh, and move to the new energy generation paradigm. 
If we home in then on the ESCOM energy fleet availability, uh, the blue line, the upper curve is the energy availability for the whole of the ESCOM fleet. And the black curve is the energy availability for the coal fleet only. It's quite apparent that the energy availability factors over the last five years have been dropping rather alarmingly. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they continue to do so in 2020 year to date. Uh, and it's this availability factor that is um, one of the root causes of load shedding that we experience. It's worth also pointing out that about 15 years ago, the, 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 the fleet, the average fleet energy availability factor was sitting just under 90%. So I want to home in now on 2019 specifically. Uh, so we're looking at energy availability factor for 2019. The, the blue graph is a weekly plot of energy availability. And the black graph is a five week moving average of energy availability. And it's quite useful to see this because a lot of load shedding that we have or problems that are incurred are not the average because of the average energy availability of the fleet. It's the variability of the availability or the change in availability. So I've plotted this graph to show where you see those green bars. It means that the blue curve is above average. And where you see red, it means we are prone or perhaps likely to experience load shedding. And I just want to draw your attention to December 2019, when many of you will recall we had stage six load shedding for the first time. <laughs> the other important thing with this graph is that the integrated resource plan, which tells us what we need to do with our energy mix going forward, um, actually is based or premised on the ESCOM availability factor being 78%. Uh, it's currently sitting at about 66%. And just to put this in perspective, uh, that's just showing you when, when, when the black curve is below the blue curve and vice versa. And that's where 78 is. Uh, the orange curve is the average for 2019. It's actually slightly lower than that for 2020. And yet the um, uh, integrated resource plan is premised on the fact that it's going to that, or it assumes it's going to be 78. And we can see we're way off of that mark. And I think it's slowly dawning on everyone that we are probably not going to be able to push that uh, rock up the hill and balance it on the top. It's going to continue to come tumbling down. So just to highlight once again on this graph, the deviations from the average are one of the major factors leading to load shedding. So wherever you see red at the bottom of this curve, those are periods when we actually did have load shedding and where any modeling would predict we would be running light on, on, on system availability. <coughs> this is just a diagram that shows a week in, I think it's March, and it shows Monday through Sunday. Uh, the, the colors are shown in the legend there. And I just want to point out that at the moment, we're short of three things to secure our electricity system. The first is energy. And you can see the, the gray shading, if you look at the legend, is gas. We, we're having to run our open cycle gas turbines way beyond what they were ever designed to run at. They're meant to only run at short periods during peak demand times. And we're having to run them very frequently <coughs> throughout the whole daytime period. We also are short of power. So uh, on this curve, the, the little white bit there actually is load shedding. It means we haven't got sufficient resources, nuclear, coal, Kahura Bassa, solar, wind, the rest. We haven't got enough to meet the demand at that point. So we're short of power. And the other thing we're short of that's not quite as apparent in this diagram is what I call flexibility. So our ability to move from a trough in the evening to that all early morning peak, we need to be very flexible and we need resources that can be dispatched and come online and ramp up at a very high rate. Now I've plotted the coal here as being a flat output. <coughs> the reality 
in the South African system is that the coal plays a very important but an uncomfortable ramping role. In other words, the coal fleet is required to accelerate and decelerate to switch from light time, nighttime lows to early morning highs. And it's this ramping of the coal fleet that also leads to uh, a loss of reliability. Anyone who knows if you travel at uh, 90 kilometers an hour in a motor car on an open road, uh, you're going to get much better uh, uh, fuel consumption, but you're also going to have lower maintenance problems than if you were driving that car um, in stop-start fashion um, in, in, in a town or urban environment where the obvious thing would be just things like brake pads, for example, would require far more regular replacement than if you were cruising. So one of the solutions, or well, the solution just quickly to look at, is if we immediately put three gigawatts of solar, two gigawatts of wind, and three gigawatt hours of storage into the system, we're going to get that picture. And if you compare that to the top one, you'll see no more load shedding, no more gas usage <coughs> in this particular month. And as I said, it was March. It's actually March 2019 where the date, real data is taken from. And we're actually starting to show surpluses. So where the solar pokes out above the uh, demand curve, you can see in many cases it's shaded brown, which means we're putting it into our pump storage. So that's how quick it would be. Uh, uh, three gigawatts of solar, two gigawatts of wind, and three gigawatt hours of storage uh, would sort out uh, all three of those problems. Uh, the energy would come from the wind and the solar. Uh, the power would, uh, would come from the fact that we're able to top up our pump storage. And we, in, in addition, we've got additional storage, which would help us both with capacity at peak times, but also with ramping requirements in the early morning. So let's just focus in on the current request for proposal uh, technical requirements. The technical requirements are that we need to add 2000 megawatts of fully dispatchable power to the grid. So we need to be able to dispatch between five and 9.30. <coughs> um, another requirement is that the minimum size that can be bid into this particular bidding round is 50 megawatts and the maximum is 450 megawatts. And that of course leads to the fact that, uh, sorry, it also, it, we also allow to have multiple facilities. So a single project can have multiple facilities, but at least one of the facilities has to be deemed uh, fully dispatchable. Um, in order to make the project uh, uh, compliant. It also applies, implies obviously with those limits set of 50 and 450 megawatts that uh, a minimum of five projects uh, could be accepted, but there could be as many as 40 projects. And, and guesstimates are that there might be somewhere around about a dozen projects that, that make it through. Uh, the projects must be able to load follow, which means they must be able to reduce their output and increase their output if called to do so by the system operator. Uh, they must also be able to throttle back to 25% of the, minim the maximum contracted capacity. So if you contract for 50 megawatts and the system operator says, I only want you to supply 12 and a half megawatts, you need to be able to throttle back to meet that requirement. Uh, they must also be able to supply what I've called a bouquet of ancillary services. They, they must have uh, the ability to assist with frequency control. Uh, they must be able to provide uh, rapid response, uh, emergency reserves and the like. And lastly, they must be able to achieve full commercial operation by June 2022. So if we look at some of the problems that I see with this is the first one is that the five to 40 projects must each individually comply. And an analogy I've given, it's perhaps slightly unfair analogy, is it's, a, it's equivalent of having a hotel where every room must provide all the services of the hotel. So every room needs to have a gym, a lounge, a swimming pool, a sauna, a kitchen, uh, a tennis court in each individual room. They're not allowed to interface with each other or take full advantage of the existing grid infrastructure. And you'll remember the very first slide I said, I said I was gonna point out 
the problem of projects not being able to make use or full use of an existing facility and that existing facility in this case is simply the grid which interconnects all projects at the speed of light. So for the RP, for, for this RFP, uh, gas and liquid, liquid fuels easily meet all of those requirements. If you build a 50 megawatt gas plant, you can run at full throttle, you can run when they want you to run, you can throttle back to 25% and you can deliver between eight uh, and nine, uh, five and 9.30 every night, no problem. Storage back wind and solar, if you try to do it with only storage back wind and solar, it's impossible. You, you simply can't meet the technical requirements of the RFP <coughs> because there'll be occasions when uh, you've got not such a windy or not such a sunny day um, and you won't be able to deliver if the system operator insists you deliver on that day. And of course, wind in particular um, blows at night and the system of the the RFP doesn't want electricity at night and so you'd have to have a very large battery um, and you couldn't make use of another battery perhaps sitting at a solar site because you're not allowed to use the functionality of the grid. <coughs> if we now move to storage back wind plus solar plus gas it's possible but once again it's inefficient, inefficient and costly because as I've said, multi-facility uh, grid interconnectivity is not allowed. So you're not allowed, for example, if your wind battery is full at night and your solar battery on another site is empty and the wind's blowing, you can't port that electricity across and store it in your solar battery. And that's, as I said, akin to uh, not making full use of existing infrastructure and facilities. Uh, projects, I think I've said before, must have at least one fully dispatchable facility. Um, and the other uh, problem is that uh, given that, that the front runner here is all projects will have to have a large component of gas, the way the RFP is structured, um, uh, and, and that these uh, bids have to be made on the basis of 20 year power purchase agreements. Uh, we'll be locking in long-term emissions and, and although <coughs> many would argue that gas emissions are lower than uh, coal emissions, others would argue that uh, methane leakages in the gas supply line uh, together with CO2 emissions during the actual burning of gas uh, collectively possibly add up to as much uh, total emission as, as what coal does. Okay, so if we try to do this with a 50 megawatt only gas or diesel system, that, that picture there is actually Sassel's 175 megawatt gas to power plant in Sasselberg. So it's got gas engines, uh, these, three, these three shared uh, exhaust um, outlets. Uh, if we did that, we would be able to meet the requirements. So this little block diagram shows the requirements, 50 megawatts, from five in the morning till 9.30 at night, and we can supply it 100%, there it is, 100% gas, no problem. My estimate for the indicative PPA tariffs, if we did gas only, <coughs> are somewhere between one rand 60 and one rand 80. This is highly dependent, of course, on the cost of gas, but it's perhaps even more dependent on the capacity factor at which those engines run, because remember, the system operator can request you at any time to throttle back to 50, uh, 25%, which would mean that your cost per kilowatt hour would go up because the proportion of cost attributable to the capital cost of the plant would then go up commensurately. If we ran it on diesel, if we didn't have gas, then uh, the cost would be around about 330 to 350 a kilowatt hour which seems to gel reasonably with uh, cost figures that one hears about for, for ESCOM's um, uh, wrongly uh, termed open cycle gas turbines, where I have a different term, I call them open cycle diesel turbines. So let's look at a picture now where we try to bring together the elements that include renewable energy. So I've got a 50 megawatt same contracted capacity. <coughs> In this instance, I've, I've, I've recommended 50 megawatts of wind, 
80 megawatts of PV, uh, 40 megawatts, 100, 160 megawatt hours of storage. And notice importantly that I've been able to drop my gas now to 20 megawatts instead of 50 megawatts. Now I need to stress that this configuration can only work if one's able to use the interconnectivity of the grid. <coughs> so you would have four meters on these four plants and the collective output or the net output of those four meters would meet system operator demands. So if the wind was producing 20 and the solar was producing 20, you and the system operator said, I need 50, you would need to either draw the additional 10 from the battery system, or you would have to fire up the gas and run it at, at 10. And if the wind was blowing at 50, <coughs> and the sun was producing, um, let's say 50 as well, uh, you'd have too much, but the, you would put some of that uh, sunlight and some of the, the wind into the battery storage then. So you would basically be able to store it to release again. So that's what that looks like. There's the same week with the same 50 megawatt from five in the morning to 9.30 at night. And you can see how we able to meet the, the 50 megawatt demand. Uh, notice also that we have excess solar and excess wind. <coughs> and if we're able to make full use of the grid, we should be able to sell this excess into uh, other markets. So we're delivering what the RFP requires. And we could, for example, sell that excess into the South African power pool or to a customer who's keen on purchasing some of that. So um, uh, uh, you'll see then if we, if we look at the actual energy output from that, we're getting 53% from solar, 42% from, from wind, 17% of the total has been cycled through batteries. And the really interesting thing here <coughs> is on an annual basis, we're only requiring about 3% gas. And on this particular model that I ran, if you look at Saturday in the top left hand corner, you'll see a tiny little gray slice there and that's a little example of gas. Uh, the 3% of the annual um, energy output coming from gas comes primarily in the winter time when we have uh, uh, less, less solar available. So if we have a, a cloudy winter day with perhaps lower wind than normal, um, we would expect to see um, uh, that 3% gas perhaps uh, running uh, quite consistently in that day. So what does this look like in terms of tariffs? <coughs> the WSSG is wind solar storage gas and the WSSD is wind solar storage diesel. And you can see the estimated price there, there's not much difference which seems a bit odd at first because we knew that diesel costs at least twice as much as gas. But then if you look at the pie chart on the left, you'll realize because there's so little diesel or gas, it doesn't actually have a major impact on the cost. Now, these tariffs are possible if one's able to sell that excess that I referred to, that excess wind and excess solar. If we can't sell it into uh, other markets, uh, such as the Southern African power pool, then these tariffs jump up to 151 and 156 more or less. <coughs> and all of the gains that we've made by being able to uh, use the grid uh, are, are pretty much lost if we can't sell that excess. And if we don't build the system, um, where, where if we build a system, the reason it has excess is because of the differences between summer and winter, particularly in solar uh, hours uh, that are available. So let's move on then to AMPs and have a look at what other um, facilities within the uh, within ESCOM and the National um, <coughs> Energy Supply System we might be able to use. Uh, these are ESCOM's three pump storage, uh, current pump storage facilities in Gula at 1.3 gigawatts of power capacity, Drakensberg can can churn out uh, about a gigawatt and Palmit can do about 400 megawatts. Collectively, uh, it's about 2.7 gigawatts of, of power capacity. 
uh, and it can do that for about 20 hours. So it's got 20 hours of, of storage and, uh, and a sort of a bottleneck, if you like, of 2.7 gigawatts. <laughs> this is a month in January 2019, showing more or less how this pump storage works. And you can see the, the, the green is, is generating from pump storage, the brown is recharging, and the blue is the level of the upper dams or, or an indica indication of how full those pump storage dams are. <coughs> Just to put it in perspective, that's Monday, that's Friday, and you can see what happens. The pump storage decreases <coughs> during the week from Monday to Friday because we're releasing more than we have the opportunity to replenish. And there's a couple of important factors here. One is that you'll see we never actually generating at full capacity, which would be 100% on the y-axis. And we're also seldom charging at full capacity. <coughs> now, partly that can be due to to one or other of the turbines at one of these facilities being, um, being on maintenance. But generally speaking, it's because the pump storage serves multiple purposes, one of which is to act as reserve capacity. So if you're running it at full tilt, you can't count what you're not using as reserve capacity. In other words, if you're releasing it to 2.7 gigawatts, you can't say I've still got 2.7 gigawatts of reserve. And then clearly we don't have enough energy, as I saw right at the beginning of this presentation, to refill it in time. So there's a form of rationing. And you can see from Monday to Friday, we kind of letting the water out so that by Friday it's more or less empty. And then over the weekend, sure, we can fill it up again for the next week. And that's more or less the way it progresses. Um, so it's a question of rationing, a question of holding back to uh, make sure that there's still reserve margin. And then thirdly, there's just simply not enough energy to, to, to retop it up. <clears throat> this shows the usage of the pump storage uh, in generation mode over a year. And you can see on average, we're only generating slightly less than a gigawatt or a thousand megawatts. Whereas we could be, we, we could be running at 2.5 gigawatts quite comfortably. <clears throat> the reason we can't do that, remember, is that we often need to hold back some of this um, to provide reserve margin, and we also need to hold it back so it doesn't run out on Wednesday. So instead of having load shedding uh, of, of stage four on Thursday and Friday, we kind of ration the water and we have load shedding of stage two throughout the week, uh, and that's pretty much the rationale. So it's underutilized capacity. It could be producing at a higher rate if, if other parts of the system were, were cooperating. Uh, in terms of refilling it, we generally only refill it at about 1.8 gigawatts. Uh, there's a very smooth curve and then that, that, that wobbly sort of curve beyond the black line, the black vertical line, just reflects a desperation filling of it, often in conjunction with load shedding. So about a month ago on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock when the sun was shining, we had load shedding at or stage two at 12 o'clock. And I can tell you now quite categorically that load shedding was to make space or to provide spare energy to be able to replenish the pump storage resources. So we were actually <coughs> experiencing load shedding on a weekend in South Africa in order to release enough coal and other sources of generation to be able to pump the pump storage back to a full state over the weekend so that on Monday we would have a we would have full tanks, so to speak. And you've often heard people from uh, the uh, marketing division of ESCOM saying uh, we we've run low on our reserve margins of water and diesel. And what they're really saying is we need to pump water up. Now remember, in order to store, you need a surplus. And that's one of ESCOM's problems is they don't have a surplus to store. Right, remember, uh, we, we have shortage of energy, power and flexibility. And if we put in the three, two and one, as I've suggested there, we sort that out. This just takes a quick look at, at so-called ramping rates. In the early morning, we have to ramp up. So the graph second from the bottom, the demand curve, the red one, shows the one hour ramp rates. 
and uh, it's for, I think it was for January 2019. <coughs> and the ramp rate peaks at about three gigawatts, which means we have to add three gigawatts to the grid within an hour. And as I've said before, coal doesn't really like to do that. It, uh, although we've trained our coal stations to be able to do that. What I wanted to show you here is that our coal fleet is, is ramping, not the full three gigawatts because it probably almost can't, but it's being assisted by the pump storage. And every now and again, gas comes in and gives a ramping hand. Um, uh, wind and solar <coughs> can't be relied on um, for ramping, although solar, if you look at the solar pattern, it's very consistent and it ramps up every day just in the natural cycle of the sun coming up. So this is just an actual picture from 2019 to show you that unlike my diagrams, the coal isn't a flat line here. The coal is ramping up and down to meet that, that switch from uh, uh, two o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock, that rapid ramp. <coughs> My diagrams tend to show coal as steady because I'm trying to find solutions that would allow the aging, unreliable coal fleet to thrum along at a steady pace instead of having to ramp up and down violently as if it was driven by, a, oh, well, let's just leave that. Okay, and if we put in our extra wind and storage, as I suggested, we've got steady coal and we've eliminated load shedding and we've eliminated uh, in this particular week that's shown here the need for gas. So this just highlights, there's our demand ramping. See the coal ramping is, is quite severe. And if you take the coal ramping together with the pump storage ramping, you can meet the demand ramping. But if we put those extra two gigawatts of batteries that I'm advocating in, then the pump storage together with the batteries gives us this amount of energy storage for ramping. And notice what's happened to the coal. The coal doesn't have to ramp at all now because this bottom ramping graph is an exact mirror image of the demand ramping. So we can meet the demand ramping entirely with a combination of pump storage plus that extra power battery that we've added. <coughs> so let's look at it then. If we add three gigawatts of, of PV, two gigawatts of wind, and two gigawatts, three gigawatt hours of what I've called power storage. And I call it power storage because it's designed for uh, a scop or a ramp in the morning. It's not designed to store a lot of energy. It's designed to be able to assist um, with short term uh, power supply. And of course, it can also be deemed then as reserve margin because that uh, the need to hold back a reserve margin <coughs> when you're running the grid, um, it, it's, it's kind of like short-term responses, millisecond, minutes, uh, 20 minutes, an hour, et cetera. Uh, the fact that we've got 20 hours in the ESCOM pump storage doesn't really help. We've only really got 2.7 gigawatts of reserve margin, irrespective of how much is stored there. So what we're really doing here is we, expanding ESCOM's uh, power uh, storage capacity um, so that it, it can have more, more power on tap. It's got plenty of energy on tap as long as we can supply enough energy. So in this model, the solar surplus, this is an annual average, is being put into storage and the wind surplus is being put into storage. And a lot of that storage is actually, um, <coughs> it's when uh, it, it allows us, if we do that, to be able to deliver this two gigawatts of output from five o'clock in the morning to 9.30 at night all year round with very um, uh, absolute consistency. Uh, the block on the, on the right where there's a white gap there is simply because it's to 9.30. So that just represents half an hour instead of an hour. And we can do that. And we have integrated and we're working in concert with existing ESCOM pump storage. So we're not trying to put all of our storage into our batteries. We've built a power battery, but we're putting surpluses into ESCOM's pump storage, which ESCOM will be thrilled about because we saw earlier that they battled to fill the pump storage on many occasions to the extent that we have load shedding on Saturday mornings when the sun's shining and we have to make space. 
and we're making use of the national grid. So we, we're using it with existing ESCOM pump storage <coughs> and we're making full use of the national grid, which is a national asset. It's not ESCOM's asset, it belongs to all of us. And it seems uh, pointless to design any system that doesn't allow us to make full use of that grid. And that's the indicative price that we could deliver at in this model. If we build three gigawatts of solar, um, two gigawatts of wind, uh, two gigawatts, three gigawatt hour of power storage, <coughs> and we were allowed to have all of these facilities talk to each other because we wouldn't build all of that on one site, we can deliver electricity at round about a rand a kilowatt hour, as opposed to the figures that I showed you previously. So if we did this, I'm recommending that in any sort of procurement process that might be designed, that a, that a certain amount of storage needs to be procured in conjunction with solar and wind. If ESCOM purchase it, I'm suggesting a feed-in tariff would be appropriate. We all know what the prices of wind and solar are more or less these days, uh, but there could be adjusted uh, feed-in tariffs for locations. So not everyone would get exactly the same feed-in tariff would depend on the complexity of grid connectivity and the actual resource at site. <coughs> if, however, we, we chose to do it via commercial PPAs, like selling, for example, to Sassel or, or Sabanya or whoever else, um, with wheeling arrangements, with wheeling, one gets a, a credit according to the wholesale electricity pricing or WEPs. And I would suggest here that there could be an augmented credit where uh, energy generated over weekends was deemed to have been stored in ESCOM's pump storage. And it was therefore released to commercial clients at peak time on weekdays, which would effectively up their wholesale electricity pricing credit slightly, and it would enable them to be uh, able to pay more for that electricity. And they would be purchasing on a responsible basis because they would be ensuring that grid services were purchased in conjunction with just renewable energy. We would have many to many transactions facilitated by ESCOM. And uh, uh, just to summarize, AMP's rapid deployment <coughs> very much includes ESCOM in an integrated approach rather than just uh, saying ESCOM is a single buyer and they're not allowed to get their hands dirty on the build makes use of existing underutilized storage assets, uh, makes full use of the utility of the national grid. Uh, we're looking at tariffs that would be 30 to 50% lower than what I'm expecting from the RFP. And I'm open to criticism on that. And it also supports responsible private PPA transactions where private companies are not simply purchasing uh, cheap renewable energy but they're ensuring that that purchase of cheap renew renewable energy is beefed up by making a contribution to the necessary capacity uh, increases that would be required if everyone were to do this. So I just want to revisit the pump storage quickly. That's just a week from that previous diagram. And I want to show you what the pump storage would look like if we did uh, if, we, if, if we purchased or built three gigs of solar, two gigs of wind and uh, two gigs of, of power storage, that's what pump storage would look like on a basis. So you would see we would be, we would be running it at full capacity when we were generating and we'd be recharging it at full capacity, but it would never actually drop during the week. So it would be sitting there as a fantastic uh, reserve margin and it would be operating less in fact, but when it did operate, it would be operating at <coughs> full uh, power capacity because there would be no constraints on having to hold it back to ensure that we had the necessary power reserve in reserve, because remember we would have that two gigawatts of battery sitting there at the same time. So we can go back to this diagram, just to remind you, that's the RFP, that's the amps, that's a modified, and I'll just put some numbers on this one to remind you of the kind of numbers we're talking at. So in the amps, the full amps version, we're looking at about a rand a kilowatt hour. 
in a modified RFP where, where grid um, utilization is allowed, grid flexibility, we're looking at uh, uh, a small gas plus solar plus wind plus storage. And in the current RFP in the mode it's in, we, we restricted to pretty much doing uh, gas only or gas and a bit of solar and we're not making full utilization of the grid. So just a future amps, uh, it's what I call Project Fibonacci. Uh, we actually need an annual build, in my opinion, of eight gigawatts of solar, <coughs> five gigawatts of wind and two gigawatts of storage. And if we did that, we can cost effectively retire the entire coal fleet by 2030. And some people who think this is crazy, I always remind them that half of the coal fleet is already retired if we look at the energy availability factors. Uh, there would be at least 200,000 and growing permanent direct jobs created, massive sustainable boost to the economy at all levels from uh, EPC companies to infrastructure build to potential localization huge health and environmental cost savings. Some of you may have noticed me coughing. It's because I live in Gauteng and the wind blows in the wrong direction sometimes. And then lastly, there would be a stabilization of the electricity price trajectory. And this can all be summarized quite nicely in this little video clip of what is achievable and we should be aiming at as a target. Thanks very much. I'll stop sharing and we can open the floor to questions. Uh, Clyde, we have some questions uh, from the text chat, if you'd like me to draw your attention to them. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Mark asked, please use words and not acronyms. I don't know if there's anything specific that he would like to <coughs> Well, it's probably the, it's probably the RI for triple P and the RFP and the AMPs and that. Uh, I apologize. I've tried in each case to show the meaning of the acronym in the first due time I use it and thereafter I tend to use the acronyms, but a point taken. Surprised that query didn't come from Chris. It's one of his <laughs> favorite chips. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Uh, okay, and then DJ D that uh, this is a very context specific, so I hope you can understand it. He's just remarked, so they would be coordinated like a VPP. Uh, that's correct, like a virtual power plant. Uh, someone else using acronyms. Thanks. Uh, so yes, it would be. It, they would be coordinated like that, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't be virtual in the sense that some people use the term virtual power plant. Um, uh, the, you know, if, if, you, if you simply had a solar and a wind uh, on separate sites and each had a battery, <coughs> they would each have a meter on those sites. And uh, as I said uh, during the presentation, if your solar battery was empty and your wind battery was full at night, uh, but the wind was still blowing, you would simply port that electricity from your wind site to your solar battery it would register on the meter, but you wouldn't get paid for it because you only get paid for anything delivered between five and, and 9.30. And then the next morning, the, the two meters would read. And if the wind wasn't blowing anymore the next morning, uh, you could use the, the wind battery and the solar battery to deliver the 50. And then as the sun came up, you, you would be able to deliver the 50 from the sun. So it's kind of quasi virtual. But I think people tend to use the term virtual power plants when these many more facilities kind of connected in a, in a, in a broader grid fashion. Okay, thanks. The next question is from Paul from Yulin, who yeah. says, it's clear that storage is in fact also relieves the variability stresses placed on coal. This is where I believe that the notion that storage must always be associated with renewals, <laughs> re uh, renewables is incorrect. Ab absolutely. I mean, you know, in the grid as it is at the moment, if you think back to those diagrams I showed uh, before I added the wind and solar, you can see that the, the surplus coal at night um, is charging up the pump storage. Uh, and then that pump storage is available for release <coughs> in the daytime. Now, the, the, the problem we've had 
of late is that the coal fleet is in such a, a, a state of disrepair, although it seems to be looking a bit better at the moment, but very much in a state of disrepair. And it simply there isn't enough surplus coal at night to, to be able to pump up the pump storage at full speed. So um, yes, uh, but, but certainly the pump storage and the coal have been working in lockstep uh, forever, basically. And, uh, um, you know, the ability to, to relieve the coal of having to play those ramping duties in the morning will have a massive impact on the reliability of the coal fleet. The idea then is that we wind down the coal fleet um, over time and as quickly as possible. <coughs> and there's lots of, 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 of uh, uh, very keen global investors who, who've offered not just South Africa, but all countries, uh, huge, huge soft loans, if they can show that they are accelerating the retirement of their coal fleets um, uh, above and beyond what, what is currently scheduled. Okay, thanks for that. Um, then Brian Day asked, as remarked, it is therefore clear that we are underutilizing the existing pumped storage below 40%, which means that energy in capitals is required before necessarily requiring dispatchable power. Therefore, renewables that can be built more quickly than gas plants absolutely are correct. actually more urgent. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely correct. I couldn't have put it better myself, but I don't want to seem to be biased. Um, we, we desperately need, if we can inject energy into the system as quickly as possible, <coughs> and we can clearly use it in, 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 in concert with ESCOM's underutilized pump storage, bingo. Uh, so I can show a model where if we put five or six gigawatts of solar in immediately, um, uh, and we put in some additional short duration power storage uh, to balance uh, uh, to, to balance the fact that future needs will require storage and wind and solar. Uh, I think someone from one of the companies I'm dealing with put it best when he said the problem with private sector companies purchasing electricity uh, in private PPAs is that they will privatize the benefits of cheap energy and socialize the costs of capacity. And what he is really saying is there's only a small window where we can do this before ESCOM's pump storage is properly utilized. And thereafter, we will have to build in a certain ratio of solar, wind and storage going forward. And so if we, if we uh, kind of slip in under the net now and don't build storage in conjunction with new uh, renewables, uh, we, we will suddenly have to catch up and build more storage in future. But the fact that we've got spare capacity in the pump storage is brilliant to us as a country because we don't necessarily need to do that immediately and we can wait for storage to become cheaper. So we can say instead of building too much storage now, we can do some of a power variety, but we can then link it with the ESCOM's pump storage and uh, buy ourselves two or three years waiting for the price of storage to, to drop further before we commit to very, very big storage projects that we will definitely need in future. Thanks, Brian. Okay, uh, Chris Yelland uh, has a general question for the participants. Is anyone from the DMRE and the IPP office uh, present at this presentation? Perhaps if anyone is, they could just uh, type that in the uh, text chat. And so we'll go straight on to the uh, to a question from ZB Kotzer. Clyde, unfortunately, your webinar represents preaching to the converted. The question is, how do we get the message out there? For example, Andre Dereta, IPP office, Gwedi Montasha, etc. Right. Well, um, uh, ZB, you'll be pleased to note, and you'll know that I've been banging this drum for some time, and and I've decided in. Because of the urgency of the situation <coughs> and the need for a, a massive economic recovery post-COVID, uh, we can't wait anymore. So I'm, I'm 
giving this particular webinar, we I did have people from NERSA and the DMRE registered, whether they actually attended or not, I can't say. So there was a Gareth Poseidon note from the DMRE that was in attendance. And there were also a number of people from NERSA and I've also got a number of uh, people attending from ESCOM. So what I've been saying here today is not really a secret. Um, and the way I'm trying to move it forward is to try and find some common ground with the IPP office to rethink the rules that they've set with the so-called emergency RFP to recalibrate them, to, to open uh, space for a flood of fast to market renewables. I think it was Chris Yelland who posted a thing on the energy WhatsApp group the other day that said that the Chinese have just commissioned a 2.2 gigawatt solar farm that was built in under a year, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So it's certainly the quickest route to solving our um, problem with regard to a lack of <coughs> a lack of energy and then the fact that if we couple it with these power batteries we sort out our capacity problems as well so yes I you know my call is to everyone is let's 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 have a real emergency procurement program and let's not um, uh, I don't know, shrug our shoulders and say we are destined to have load shedding for another two to three years until that man can push the rock to the top of the hill successfully. Uh, right, uh, that was also echoed, by the way, by Chris Joubert, who said, excellent proposal, Clyde, can you set up a meeting with Andre Dureta? So that's a, another confirmation. Uh, Daryl Hunt has asked, how would the picture change once we retire 10 gigawatts of coal, is it merely the same concept, but at scale? Uh, absolutely. I can, I can refer people to an article I wrote recently in uh, Energize magazine called Dancing to the New Generation. And the interesting thing is that if we build um, uh, wind and solar and storage at scale, we very quickly reach a point where our ability to meet our current electricity demand is actually easy. We, we <coughs> in fact, we over, we over deliver. And the point about over delivering is that that surplus electricity uh, would start to become available for transitions in other sectors, such as transport and industrial heating and cooling. And so um, if we build at the rate I'm recommending of the 853 per year or some variant of that um, uh, by 2050 or before then, in fact, by 2030, uh, we will see a very different demand profile. And instead of us desperately scrambling to meet the country's electricity demand profile, we will be producing a generation profile that will meet the current demand profile <coughs> and the new demand sectors will then adapt to drawing their demand from the generation profile. So we'll be dancing to the new generation rather than trying to fill the current demand profile uh, sort of, it, it's kind of back to front at the moment, it's going to switch. So strangely enough in future, we're going, to need, um, we're going to need storage mainly to deliver at night. We're going to have plenty in the daytime. And our storage, instead of topping up at night from ESCOM coal, is going to be delivering at night. So the whole picture is going to change. And we need to, we need to put a, a marker at about 2040, I would say, <coughs> of where we're going to be when virtually the whole coal fleet will be retired, whether, whether, whether done um, uh, in a structured fashion or not. And we will be able to comfortably deliver everything we need from a combination of wind, solar and, and storage. And remember, we still have uh, about four gigs of gas available from ESCOM and private sector. So if you remember that one pie chart of mine where I said, here's the wind, here's the solar, here's the storage, and we need 3% gas. Well, when you scale it up, that picture stays the same. Uh, and uh, if you scale it up to the extent I do, we don't even need that 3% gas anymore. And if we did, it could very well be hydrogen. So thanks. Right. Uh 
Farouk is asking when the if, if and when and where the recording will be available. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'm recording in the cloud, so I just hope I got it on a cumulonimbus instead of a cirrus. But anyway, uh, I'll I'll get hold of that recording and and chop out uh, any any fluff on the beginning or the end and make it available as soon as possible. So we'll, we'll email you with the link to where the recording is going to be housed. Uh, Zedby Kotsa has asked, pardon my ignorance, is MACE, the Ministerial Advisory Council on Energy, still operational? Uh, I, I actually have no idea, but we passed the need for councils. It's time to move. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking with a number of large industrial customers because I believe that the essence of the AMPS proposal can be underpinned if we can get a dozen or so energy intensive users to agree to enter into power purchase agreements where they would contribute a component of storage as well as just purchasing either wind or solar in order to assist South Africa in stabilizing and eliminating load shedding and put us on a good growth path. So I'm, 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 I'm in discussion at the moment with, with numerous companies. And the idea is to, to, <coughs> to also fully integrate ESCOM into this. Um, the model I have actually includes ESCOM as a, an equity participant if they so choose. And they would essentially be vending in their surplus capacity in their pump storage in order to get their equity stack. So it would be it would cost ESCOM nothing, and it would be a good opportunity to start what I like to call ESCOM Green, as a private public partnership. But I want to do it driven by private, um, where the public part of it comes along on not a freebie, but as a as a <coughs> as the system operator essentially, and. Um, uh, uh, it, it seems to me that when, when, when you speak to people about triple P's, their eyes glaze over and they say, geez, I thought this was an emergency. So we need to find some way of, of enacting or doing this without having to go through uh, every hoop. And let's just say, let's just call it the equivalent of a COVID uh, disaster. Let's call it an energy uh, supply industry disaster and we need to be thinking differently about how we fix it. Okay, we're going to move along from there. Um, FC Basan has asked, uh, we know yeah. that two new coal power stations, one of 50 years and the timber at 25, will not be retired by 2030. How practical is it to discuss a 2030 scenario? Should we not focus on a more realistic approach for our scenario? I think I heard you talking about 40 years. Have you answered this already? Yeah, look, the, my, my, my preference is a 10-year retirement of the whole coal fleet. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, global analysis from all sorts of institutions, Rocky Mountain Institute, <coughs> the point is we're rapidly approaching a time when wind and solar and storage will cost less than the operation and maintenance and fuel costs, even of paid off existing coal plant. So <coughs> remember also that uh, an accelerated retirement uh, opens us up to all sorts of funding opportunities that may not be there uh, according to the current scheduled retirement. So I'm not asking for a mass uh, collapsing of the, of, of the coal fleet. What I'm saying is that what I would do if I was Andre de Reiter is I'd go to my engineering team and say to them, right, we need 180 terawatt hours from coal next year, 160 next year, 140 the year after that, then 120, then 100, etc. And if that's 10 or 12 or 14 years, doesn't really matter. But it would give the guys who are trying to keep those old coal things running an absolute uh, target to which towards which to work. And we then would be Basically, if we build the renewable and storage <coughs> that I'm advocating, it would give us space to be able to retire the coal fleet with dignity. Whereas at the moment, we're keeping the coal fleet alive in an undignified fashion because we haven't created the space for it to, 
to be given a, a, a dignified burial after all the years of service that they've given us. So that's my take on it. Okay, then uh, Chris Yelland has a quick comment. I think that doesn't require a response, but I'll read it out. Thanks to Clyde for a really important, clear presentation, free of the nonsense we so often hear on the need for energy mix involving coal and nuclear and hydro from the DRC. I just wish people from the IPP office and DMRE would wake up and listen. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, then we have a question from Paul Vermeulen. Considering the grid extends into the municipal areas, locating the storage at sensible sites on these networks could bring additional value by relieving stress on those networks, still with ESCOM as buyer and, and dispatcher. Is there enough of a correlation between the national load peaks and the municipal peaks? Paul, Paul that's perfect. And in fact, we, we, we in discussions with numerous municipalities, you know, you and I have had discussions, the IPP office, the RFP, absolutely forbids the placement of batteries uh, away from either a solar or a wind plant. So if you're going to build a solar farm, your battery has to be co-located to be able to, um, that's it. So uh, it, it, it makes absolute sense to rather place the batteries within the metros, uh, closer to the distribution side of the grid, because they'll still serve all the same purposes uh, for, for the grid in terms of <coughs> um, um, uh, rapid response, ancillary services, etc. But they would also prove a massive uh, aid to uh, with inside municipalities where they would alleviate uh, bottlenecks and pinch points on your network at peak times. So yes, and this is, this is where I'm really calling for, I, I believe, and this is a personal opinion, that this emergency response should be driven uh, primarily by ESCOM with assistance from uh, uh, consultants or whatever, if that's even necessary, because we need to go to war on, on solving our energy crisis. And ESCOM is basically our energy army. Um, uh, if we were going to war, I would want to send the army rather than parliament uh, or whoever else to fight on our behalf. And so I firmly believe that the skill set exists within ESCOM and they just need to be given the encouragement to, to, be, uh, to be allowed to participate in ways other than just being seen as being the designated single buyer. So yes, I, I, I think working on a team together with ESCOM to solve this would be a, a far faster solution uh, than what seems to currently be happening. And I don't know how to make that happen. I'm, 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 I'm certainly in for, a, in for it. So. Okay, we're going a little over time. So we need to uh, be quick with the <coughs> remainder of our questions. Uh, but as, as Clyde said, these are, will be recorded. So if you do need to move on to another meeting, we'll still have the recorded responses to these questions. Uh, Liz Longer asks a question. It might be rhetorical. Uh, the AMP seems much greener, cheaper, and faster to achieve. Why is climate change not important for the DMRE and policymakers? Why lock in gas for 20 years? Uh, look, I don't want to comment on what might be underpinning the, <coughs> the, the IPP office RFP. It certainly is, is, is gas-oriented. Um, the one thing I must say that surprised me is when I went to the IPP uh, bid conference in January before COVID lockdown. Uh, all the talk was around short-term uh, PPAs, two years, three years, five years. Uh, we'll only let you do 10 years. If It, it was all short-term emergency stuff, power barges in the harbors, you name it. And then suddenly, imperceptibly, I, I think at the online bidders conference the other day, someone said, are we allowed to submit a PPA that runs for less than 20 years? And the response was very quick and very categorical. No, it's got to be a 20 year PPA. So um, <coughs> it looks to me as if, as if the RFP is looking to lock in long-term power purchase agreements. And because it's, uh, it's almost impossible to do without a gas component, you know, a, a cynic might say it's it's looking to provide an anchor offtaker tenant for a 
for a big gas industry in South Africa, when the rest of the world, those who currently have very good gas infrastructure and live close to Henry Hub or wherever else, are, are, are getting out of gas as quickly as they possibly can. So it just, I don't know. I, I don't want to step on any toes there, but it, it does seem inconceivable and irrational, Thank quite frankly. Thank you, Clyde. Um, a question from <coughs> Ronald. What is yeah. the impact on the tariff to support your suggestion? Well, the, on the, if, if it's the current tariff, it, it, it'll align well with the current ESCOM tariffs. If it's compared and contrasted to what I expect the tariffs of the RFP to be, it will be significantly cheaper. Uh, the other thing is that the, the way I've modeled it, the private sector companies, if they did it that way, would pick up that tariff tab. but wouldn't be on ESCOM's balance sheet. And <coughs> it would come in at uh, slightly less than the current wholesale electricity. So the credit they would get from ESCOM from WEPS would be slightly greater. The main savings I see as a country and to ESCOM, in fact, is a 20 fold reduction in the need to run the OCDTs and an end to load shedding uh, as quickly as we can build the, at this at scale. So it would be it would be tariff, it would be future tariff positive. And very importantly, it would be looking at starting to design an end use system for 2040 today to make sure that the components we put in place <coughs> mirror that. So just to, to finish that, I, I can foresee that, that we could stabilize a tariff going forward. We probably need a, a tariff at the moment of about one rand twenty um, going forward, uh, but we would be able to stabilise that tariff and possibly even have increases that were lower than CPI going forward. But we've got ourselves into a position where we're paying so much um, uh, debt off uh, for the likes of Madupi and Kasili. If we could somehow make Madupi and Kasili and all their debt disappear we probably could uh, lower the current tariff would be my response. If, if we could park all of that debt somewhere else. Okay, and there's a question from the Lady M. Factoring the cost variables between the different energy sources, is there a particular criteria that the system operator utilizes to prioritize preferred energy source in order to mitigate cost exposure? Yeah, look, that's a complicated question. Uh, in, in open free markets, the system operator normally dispatches what's cheapest at an instantaneous point in time. The problem with South Africa's uh, independent power producers program is that it said that the system operator has to buy any wind and solar. And that is typically what happens in open markets because that's the cheapest electricity. There's no marginal cost. Uh, there's no fuel or anything. So if the wind's blowing and the sun's shining, your plant is producing. But it's also why in certain uh, jurisdictions, they've, it's led to negative pricing, where the system operator doesn't want that extra wind or solar because the system's got too much and, and they actually pay people to take it, so to speak, almost like what happened recently with the, with the um, oil price, uh, we, we went into negative territory for a while. So <coughs> it's complex, uh, but the, a, a quick, simple answer to that would be that, that uh, the role of storage will become more and more important. And as the market opens up, that will become more apparent. And so uh, I imagine that uh, electricity tariff structuring as we currently know and understand it is, is set to change significantly. Um, but whether that will be in a controlled nursaic kind of way, or whether it will be in a fully open tradable market, I'm, I'm not certain. What I do know is that the, the cheapest solutions going forward all are various combinations of wind, solar and storage. It's as simple as that. Uh, and <coughs> in South Africa, we're very fortunate because our interseasonal variability on solar is nothing, nothing like the 
interseasonal variability in much of Europe and, and, and many countries around the world. So we're, we're able to get away, if you like, with, with far less storage than, than is required in some of these uh, higher latitude uh, countries. Okay, thanks. Uh, ZB Kotz is asking, uh, Clyde, do you perhaps have a number for the PJ slash A gas required based on the latest bidding round requirement? Peter Juper and I'm glad. Yeah, I, 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 I struggle to switch between Peter Jules and, uh, and uh, Terawatt Hour. Can I get back to you on that one? I can't do it in my head. I know that um, uh, if we go gas only, it will be quite a lot because it will be 2000 megawatts of gas engines or, or turbines. If we combine the gas with wind and solar and batteries and make full utilization of the grid without even bringing the surplus pump storage into play, it would be a tiny number because it would, instead of being 100% for the 2000 megawatts, it would be 3%. So my answer is that whatever the answer is, it ranges from about 5% to 100% of that answer. And clearly, if you're trying to establish a gas offtake market, you're going you're gonna to back something that gives you the 100% rather than the 5% version. Because you, you. You, you, you want to be able to sell your gas, of course. Good enough. Thanks, Lloyd. Yeah, okay. Uh, th thanks for clarifying, ZB. Um, for Rook, there's just a thank you from him. We need to share more broadly. He'll be doing so within his networks. Thank you for Rook. Uh, Penny is asking, what is the CapEx cost of the AMPS proposal? What is the Forex component of the CapEx? <coughs> okay, the CapEx cost um, is about nine, 90 billion Rand. Uh, and I've got a model where there would be no Forex required. I've got a model of... Uh, uh, on one extreme, which is, a, which is a huge extreme, I've got a model for crowdsource funding it in South Africa. Uh, 6, South Af 6 million South Africans each put in 3,000 Rand with a 12,000 Rand bank loan, uh, underwritten by uh, National Treasury PPA if necessary, and we've got your 90 million. So this, this 90, this, no, sorry, 90 billion, the 90 billion fleet could be owned by 6 million South Africans. Uh, and it would also enable 6 million South Africans who haven't got enough money to enter into the property bond market to seek the equivalent of a property bond market from the banking sector. So in very simple terms, uh, you know, Clyde Manninson comes along, he puts in three grand, he borrows 12 grand from uh, Bank X, uh, and his dividends from this uh, would be sufficient to service the, the, the 12 grand that he's borrowed and leave money in his pocket. And within a year or two, <coughs> he would be able to um, have recovered his three, his, his three grand that he put in himself. And ideally, if that then got listed in some way, it would also make it liquid. So I actually don't believe personally, that we need any Forex. We just need ways of tapping into our multi-trillion rand pension funds in a sensible fashion, other than just uh, dumping it into ESCOM debt. Thanks, Clyde. Um, we've got thank yous from Felix and Emil, who've had to move on. Uh, a comment from De Palello is a question, is there anyone who can facilitate a meeting between Clyde and Minister Montage to discuss this? Uh, I suggest if there is other type, uh, maybe just contact Clyde directly. Um, Vida Schnabel has uh, asking a question. I would like to propose that we use the next RE forum to present this to the minister and DMRE and Andre Durator. That's an interesting suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Celeste Renner, thank you for a great presentation. Looking forward to seeing this enter wider forums. Uh, DJ J, will you be making a more detailed report detailing the assumptions, LCOEs, LCOs? Can Mrs. I quickly respond to that one? I, I, I think mm. DJ is from the Western Cape government. Uh, I stand corrected uh, and I apologize if I've got that wrong, DJ. And I also apologize if I've outed you. But uh, uh, I, I've got a very 
nice version of this proposal, which is a one in 10 scale version. And it's basically for the city of Cape Town where they would use the Steenbros pump storage in the same way that ESCOM used the Ingula, Drakensberg and Palmet. And the city of Cape Town in conjunction with, uh, if they purchased, uh, I think five and a half, uh, five and a half hundred, 550 uh, megawatts of solar and, and put some power batteries in the city of Cape Town and then did uh, uh, a scale version as I've indicated of what, uh, what I'm suggesting on a country basis, they could deliver a guaranteed 200 megawatts from, from five in the morning to 9.30 at night every day of the year and thereby reduce the need for the country to to procure 2000 megawatts, they'd only have to procure 1,800. And uh, um, uh, I've, I've taken the proposal to the city of Cape Town and, and rightly so they said our current uh, red tape around triple P's and PMGA's and P who was, who didn't like acronyms. Well, you should just look at all the acronyms, acronyms around the public service sector. Anyway, the, the bottom line was that it wouldn't be possible to put in a bid in time for this RFP program. And then secondly, we weren't allowed to because the batteries weren't allowed to be placed in the city of Cape Town. And thirdly, um, I, I kind of wanted to do it for all the big metros. It just happened that the city of Cape Town had Steenbros. But I've also made proposals to Etiquini and to City Power. And the general answer is we'd love to, but the regulatory environment and the timeframes basically make it impossible. So I would love to engage with, 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 with all municipalities on this score. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, what I'm trying to achieve here actually is <coughs> just going back to the notion of the crowd sharing, which is a bit of an off, off, off the wall notion, perhaps. It's an opportunity for all South Africans to feel they've played a part in, in yeah. Okay, thanks, Clyde. Um, Penny's got a follow up to her question. Clyde, just to clarify the Forex question, what, what of the CapEx will be imported at, and at what rate of exchange are you converting the imported <coughs> CapEx? I think the crowdfunding idea is a great one. Okay, well, the CapEx, the CapEx coming in for solar, uh, we, most, of, most of the funding, will be, most of it will be imported. Unfortunately, we put a knife into our local manufacturing capabilities in South Africa. So we had companies who were, who were laminating solar panels. We had companies who were making wind towers. Um, I think in this emergency procurement, first of all, we, we must recognize that it's gonna be Forex. Uh, we're gonna to have to import a lot of the stuff. But if we can build the kind of pipeline that I'm looking to build, I have it on good authority from a number of solar manufacturers at least, that they would seriously contemplate putting up a full-blown uh, solar factory here. But then they need the pipeline. It can't be a stop-start affair. Um, so, uh, Penny, just to answer your question, I used an exchange rate of 16.5 um, uh, to the dollar. And I also used uh, uh, EPC costs for solar and wind and storage that were somewhat conservative. Uh, certainly that conservative if you spoke to someone like Anton Eberhardt. Okay, th thanks Clyde. Um, uh, that is the last question in the chat, so I'll hand back to you to field any possible audio questions. Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to, it's getting late. <coughs> I've, I've got another webinar with the Benchmarks Foundation all afternoon this afternoon, so I'm going to need to but I can certainly, if anyone would like to unmute themselves and ask a verbal question, feel free. Well, Clyde from Vito here. Thank you very, very much. This was a brilliant presentation. Very easy to understand, although there were a few acronyms. But um, I think, um, as somebody said earlier, preaching to the converted, we'll try to get you an audience um, with uh, the minister and uh, Mr. Derota. Thanks, Vito. And, and thanks for the support. 
Um, ZB is commenting over here, CSR anticipated load shedding going forward, and there is a link in the chat which people might find helpful. Yeah, um, one of the things I didn't want to, to, to uh, spend too much time on because it's an old chestnut of mine is the cost to the economy of load shedding. And, uh, you know, every day that we can bring new energy capacity into the system is a, is a potential day of load shedding saved. So when people are trying to chase uh, uh, procured prices down to the bottom, so to speak, to see if we can get solar at 59 instead of 50, instead of 61 or whatever the number is, um, what they're missing is that the time taken to arrange all of these procurement uh, things, uh, probably every month that we delay uh, would result in X amount of load shedding, which would probably add one cent onto that cheapest price. So if we delay by 12 months, we could have a price that was 12 cents higher than the RPP office lowest bid price, and it would still be better for the country and the economy. Um, but I, you know, I, I think everyone's aware of that. I, I, what they're perhaps not aware of is the the ability to leverage and utilize the the grid and the pump storage assets that we currently own collectively as a country. Um, Clive, Clive. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Penny. Hi, Clive. Um, and can you just give me the split between the various uh, um, technologies, the wind, solar, and storage, in terms of capex? Yeah, I'm looking at <coughs> the, the, well, look, the, if, if I, the numbers I'm saying there, the, the solar was three gigs, so that would be about, uh, take it at, uh, to be safe, take it at $0.7 a, a watt, so it's, so it's three, so it's 20, 2.1 uh, million, is that right? Have I done the numbers correctly? To, to, for, if I did three gigs, it would be, anyway, I'm, I'm using a number of around about 0.7 dollars a watt for solar, and I'm using about 1.1 dollar a watt for wind. So the solar and the wind dollars come to a very similar number because I've got more solar than wind. And then the storage is highly dependent on whether you integrate it with ESCOM pump storage or not. So if it's integrated with ESCOM pump storage, your storage costs are much lower because you've got high capacity, low storage storage. Uh, and if you don't integrate it with ESCOM, your cost per kilowatt hour is less, but you've got to have more kilowatt hours available. So the storage costs range from about $300 a kilowatt hour to $700 a kilowatt hour if you go for a power version. In other words, a, a, a one megawatt battery for, or one gigawatt battery for half an hour would cost you a lot more per kilowatt hour than a one gigawatt battery for four hours. So the splits are, are more or less equal for wind and solar and approximately, uh, uh, it's probably about 25% for storage. So it's kind of like, what would that be? 40, 30, uh, 37 and a half, 37 and a half, 25, something like that. Thanks. But I can I can give you more details if you're interested. I, I'm just doing that off the top of my head at the moment. Client Vito, maybe an info as well. Um, we've just finished a project in the US, a 300 megawatt hour <laughs> storage called Mustin. And yeah. the average price um, per kilowatt hour for solar plus storage, and storage meaning four hours of um, storage, yeah. Uh, yeah. comes to six US cents, six US cents per kilowatt hour. But okay, those well both that, together. Well, that gels very closely. If you take six times 16, what do you get, Vida? Six times 16 and a half, you get about one rand and four cents, which is the number that I showed on that one diagram. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Okay, get your calculator out. 16 times six, okay. 60, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so yes, it's, 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 it's of that order. Uh, you know, sometimes when people quote very, very low prices uh, for these things, you have to be very careful. So I think I've seen some people say they can do solar plus storage at $4 cents, 
The problem there is you've got to look very carefully how much storage are they talking about? Is it just a pen like battery at the guard's tower on the solar farm? Or is it serious storage? And then the second thing is uh, many of these countries have uh, capital uh, tax uh, incentives for renewables and they don't always disclose those. And then the third thing is in some of these countries, they pay negative interest rates virtually. So it's quite difficult to do direct comparisons with South Africa, but certainly I think we can do wind and solar with four hour storage at around about $6 cents a kilowatt hour. That's the right number.